Well, morning all. Really uh, good to uh, really good to see you. Um, let me remind uh, those who are here from uh, yesterday and those who uh, weren't. Let me tell you what we covered yesterday. Essentially, we started off by saying this issue of sexuality is an issue that involves people. So it involves people like me, for whom same-sex attraction is a personal issue. It'll also be an issue around uh, family and friends. It'll be an issue as we witness to, uh, to non-Christians. It will be something we want to consider as we're involved in parenting uh, and so on. So sexuality is an issue that involves people. And then what we considered was the, uh, the Bible's picture on this. And we looked at four reasons, essentially, why Christians should believe that marriage is to be between a man and a woman. So we went back and looked at the whole purpose of the universe, and that the universe is at its best, not when we look inside ourselves, see what's there and live it out, but actually when we listen to the voice outside us, when God tells us who we are. So we looked at the whole purpose of the universe. We looked at the teaching of Jesus, that when Jesus asked a question about sexual ethics, he defines marriage as being between a man and a woman. We looked at the sweep of the Bible and saw the Bible's glorious love story, that the whole history of the universe is heading towards a glorious marriage between Christ and the church. And we said that essentially sexuality is a signpost. Let me just pause there for one moment and pick up something I should have said and didn't. Because we talked about the church being the bride and Jesus being the bridegroom. And it might be for around half of us that the thought of being a bride forever is a slightly weird concept. And the point actually is this. It isn't that the ultimate relationship with Jesus is sexual. It's just that the deepest emotions that we feel in this life are often in the whole area of love and sex and romance. And that's a picture of the sheer intensity of feeling there will be between Christ and the church forever and ever. That's why you use that sort of language. Not because the ultimate relationship is sexual, but the intensity of feeling we have in that area of life is but a picture of eternity. Uh, and then uh, lastly, we reflected on the whole shape of the Christian life. That actually for all of us, the Christian life will involve some aspect of denying ourselves, even things that feel quite important to us, in order that we might gain eternal life and gain Jesus. So there you go. Actually, you didn't need to come yesterday. I've just summarized it in about four <laughs> minutes. But what I want to do today is try and get a little bit more practical. What does all that mean for the way in which we do church life and for the way in which we live in society, witness in our culture? Let's think about church a little bit. Here's a verse that I've only reflected on recently, uh, really, from... Uh, this might work or might not work. If I manage to turn it off, it's definitely not doing well, It's funny, it always works in, when you practice earlier and never actually in reality. This is definitely not doing anything. There is an on, it is definitely on. There's no light flashing. Sorry about this, everybody. Aha, that worked. Oh, no, it's gone off again. Um, if you, if, can you advance it? Is that brilliant? So we look at 1 Timothy 3, verse uh, 15, which is um, a verse that I've reflected on a little bit recently, where Paul is talking about the church, and he talks about the church as God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Now, I want to notice two things about the church there. Firstly, the church is to be a pillar and foundation of the truth. That is to say, it is to lift up and display God's truth to the world around. On a whole heap of areas, but including God's perspective on marriage. In other words, the church is to display to the world what marriage is ultimately about, a picture of Christ in the church, and to live it out in the way that God has designed in creation. I have to be honest, speaking personally as somebody for whom this is a personal issue, 
I couldn't be in a local church that was telling me I could have a same-sex marriage blessed. Personally, I would struggle to be in that context because it just wouldn't be helpful for my discipleship. And the church is to be a pillar and foundation of the truth. But notice the other thing that the church is to be. The church is to be God's household. That is to say, God's family. The church is to be the family to encourage people to persevere. And really it's that aspect of being God's family that I want to reflect on a little bit in our first part. Uh, I work for a group called uh, Living Out. Living Out is a group of uh, church leaders, experienced same-sex attraction, committed to a biblical view of marriage. Um, and we work quite closely actually with a group called True Freedom Trust. Living Out does quite a lot of public stuff. At True Freedom Trust, a great organization that does quite a lot of pastoral care for those for whom this is personal, their parents. And so if that's you, True Freedom Trust are a great group to get uh, in contact with. But what the Living Out team did, actually they did this before I joined the staff. So if you don't like what's about to come, I, I didn't write it, but um, Living Out put together what we've called a church audit, basically a way of reflecting on whether as local churches we are biblically inclusive. Now what does biblically inclusive mean? It means that our church gatherings, our church services, everybody is welcome to. Everybody is welcome to, to join in church services and so on. And then the church itself, which is a gathering of believers, that, if you like, is made up of all those who will turn to Jesus in repentance from whatever background. The gospel is gloriously inclusive of all those who will turn to Jesus, whatever their background in terms of sexuality and so on. And so here are 10 points I'm going to try and talk through reasonably quickly to help us reflect on how we create a church culture that is biblically inclusive. And the first one is this, your church Excellent. There we go. Your church, thank you. Your church family meetings include people who could be labelled LGBTQI plus or are same sex attracted. Now, let me tell you what that means. That doesn't mean if you're part of quite a small church of I don't know 15 people that you've got to go around and say, come on, one of us must be same sex attracted, <laughs> so we can pass the living out test. Nor does it mean that people for whom same-sex attraction is a personal issue need to be very public about it and end up you know, speaking on a big stage. What it is to say is that we want to create church cultures where if this is a personal issue for people, they think this is a safe place to talk about it. Actually, that should be true for all of us, whatever our individual battles and struggles. Just a hint for any here who might end up up front at church. I developed a kind of mantra. Often you'd end up speaking about sexuality, either perhaps because of issues within a denomination or culture or so on. And I kind of developed a mantra which went something like this. Look, I've just mentioned sexuality. If you wonder where we are on this, we believe that all human beings are worthy of dignity and respect, irrespective of their sexuality. Because of the love story at the heart of the universe and, what marriage point, and the way marriage points to that, we do believe that sex is from marriage between a man and a woman. And if this is personal for you, or if you've got questions about that, we'd love to talk. That was just the kind of mantra I kind of tried to develop, which was basically saying, if this is personal for you, we want this to be a place where we can talk about it. Because temptations are hard to battle alone. I want to create a culture where it is possible to experience some degree of challenge in that area and be able to speak about it. Then, uh, secondly, I don't need to spend long, I don't think, on this. Uh, derogatory uh, language or stereotyping attitudes towards anyone wouldn't be tolerated either up front or in conversation between church family members. In other words, we don't want to use language like gay as just a sort of insult or in a pejorative way, or give the impression that all people who struggle with same-sex attraction are like this. We just want to be careful in the language we use. And then thirdly, all in your church know that we all experience sexual brokenness. All are being encouraged to confess their own sexual sins. 
You do know as we talk about the issue of sexuality, there is no unbroken place for any of us to stand. Unless you're about to claim that the only person you've been attracted to is somebody you're married to, my guess is this is just an issue for all of us, actually. And just having that attitude, that humble brokenness as we talk about it, recognizes that this will be an issue for all the church family in different ways. Now, in terms of confessing our own sexual sins, that isn't to say you all have to do that really publicly, but actually where this is a challenge for all of us, to have some people we're talking to is just healthy because sin grows in the dark. And then number four, same-sex sexual relationships are never mentioned in isolation from other sinful patterns of behavior or from the forgiveness offered to all through faith in Christ crucified. I made this point, I think, in passing yesterday, that the same-sex sexual relationships are mentioned as sinful in the New Testament, which they are. They're generally part of a list, part of a list of sins. Actually, even in Romans 1, where there's more time spent in it, Romans 2 verse 1 starts, and you who pass judgment on others, you have no excuse. In other words, we recognize that the Bible does say sex is for a marriage between a man and a woman, and outside that is sinful, in the same way that other things are sinful as well. And the cross is sufficient gloriously for all of us. And then all in your church are hearing the same call to radical self-sacrifice themselves in response to God's giving of himself in Jesus. Now, we saw yesterday that Jesus' call to be a Christian is take up your cross, deny yourselves, follow me. That's just normal Christianity. And probably it's helpful, and generally I think it is the case, where in our churches, as we look around, we see that's just the Christianity we're all living. It isn't the case of, well, we're all living some of the nice peacetime Christianity, and there are no real, oh, you're same-sex attracted, you've got to make a sacrifice. Now, actually, as I look around the churches that I've been part of, gloriously, you can see, actually, they're trying to live as a, the only Christian in their family. For them, actually, you see the way in which they're committed in their time and energy and effort. Actually, that's true for all of us. And it makes it plausible for people who are same-sex attracted not to live out a sexual relationship because, hey, we're all making sacrifices in following Jesus. And we're following Jesus, the one who went to the cross. That's just built in to what it is to be a Christian. And then all in your church are encouraged to develop an identity founded first and foremost on their union with Christ. Let me tell you one of the most important moments for me. It was when I was a, a student uh, last century, and um, I was in a, a Christian union meeting, and the, uh, the preacher was speaking on Ephesians chapter 1. And in Ephesians chapter 1, you have that repeated idea, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And the preacher made an application that was actually quite unusual for the 1990s. He talked about uh, Brian Paddock, I think it was, Deputy Chief Commissioner of the Met Police at the time, who'd just come out as gay. And the preacher noted that was quite a brave thing for him to have done. And then looked at a group, probably about this size actually, and said, look, for some of you, that will be your issue. I want you to know this. Your identity is that you are in Christ. That is the most important thing about you. Now, fully enough, at that stage, I don't think I'd spoken to anybody else. I was desperately concealing the tears running down my face. But that's the essence of who you are. But can I say in passing, actually, I think that's quite a healthy perspective for all of us. The most important thing about us is that we are joined to Jesus. And then we live that out with the various other identities that we're given. So I'm joined to Jesus, and I live out my life loving my spouse or loving my kids. And again, where all of us are saying that's the most important thing about us, and we live that out in the various other identities God has given, then actually that just becomes coherent. Somebody who's same-sex attracted, we're all kind of living out the same thing, essentially, aren't we? Joined to Jesus and living that out. Um, a godly Christian sexual orientation will never prevent them from exercising their spiritual gifts or serving in leadership in your church. Now, let me underline one thing here. It is talking about a godly Christian's 
sexual orientation. I've got a friend of mine, she's very honest about this sort of person, actually the story Jenny was based on, that I used yesterday, who would talk about becoming a Christian and getting involved in leading worship in her church and then getting into a, a same-sex sexual relationship. And she talks about how the pastor just handled that superbly, went, listened, understood this was painful and difficult for her, but said, look, we can't actually have you leading worship at this point. Now, let's try and give it three to six months. Let's see how, how you, get, you need to wrestle with and think what you want to do. And so we're not about to immediately sort of take you out of church membership. But we want to give you time to reflect on it. And she ended up saying, actually, it was that combination of clarity. This was sin. It wasn't compatible with being a Christian. And the compassion and the understanding of the pain she felt living a single life and some of the difficulty of that which actually gloriously meant she ended up repenting and coming back to living wholeheartedly for the Lord. And I do think we need that mixture of clarity and compassion. But actually where you have somebody who is wanting to live for the Lord, who is battling temptation as we all do, actually we want to use people to serve the Lord. Um, I uh, was pastor of a church in Oxford for about uh, 20 years ago. For the first uh, 10 years, the elders, the church leaders knew uh, about my sexuality. The, the church didn't. Um, and after a while, I thought, actually, this isn't actually sustainable, um, partly because I need to get them to stop praying that to find a wife, but, but, also, <laughs> but, but also, actually, these were people I loved deeply, and there was sort of something I was working through that they didn't know about. So um, we kind of set up a series where we looked at things like singleness, friendship, uh, homosexuality, I think we called it. Sent an email out, you know, Andy's, we're going to do this series, Andy's going to do the one on homosexuality, uh, and this is why. That's quite an interesting email to press send on, actually. <laughs> to be honest, what I expect, I didn't think there'd be problems. What I expected was a sort of awkward silence. Let's pretend that hasn't happened. <laughs> As it is, I got emails back from about three quarters of the church, which I still find quite moving, actually. And in a sense, they've got what we wanted to try and communicate as a living out team, actually, that where you have somebody who is trying to live for the Lord, albeit with temptation, then actually we want to use those gifts in the church. And then let me mention this. I think this is uh, number eight. This is the one most churches have fun with. God's gifts of either singleness or marriage are equally promoted, valued, and practically supported in your church family's life together. The Bible describes marriage and singleness as both being good gifts whereby we can serve the Lord. It is tricky though, isn't it? Because I guess for many, marriage is kind of what we aspire to, and sometimes as a church we can give the impression that is kind of best. Yeah, probably, I guess, many of us, if we've got kids, we, we kind of really hope they're getting married one day. Well, it's actually, I guess, the goal is we want them above all else to be serving the Lord. Um, so the church that I, I pastored, they were wonderful, actually. So forgive me a story which makes them look slightly bad. But um, there was uh, somebody actually in, my, in the church, a little bit older than me, actually had now left, moved to another geographical area, who got engaged. And the church has a WhatsApp group, which is a source of great blessing. And um, in, the, uh, in the church WhatsApp group, there was a sort of, hey, so-and-so's got engaged with a picture. And of course, for the rest of the day, that meant my phone kept beeping. Hey, congratulations, beep. Hey, wonderful, beep. Hey, fantastic, beep. Hey, emoji of a party popper, beep. And that was all fine. As the day went on, I got slightly more concerned, though, Hey, he's finally managed it. And I remember thinking, oh, this is probably a teaching opportunity, isn't it? So it was a Saturday night, and I fired into, this is really good news. I'm really pleased, and I know we're all equally pleased when he was using his singleness to serve the Lord. I press send. Now, that was great, because nobody did write anything after that. <laughs> And my phone stopped beeping. And probably everybody thought, gosh, Andy's in a grumpy mood tonight. <laughs> it was half serious. 
Just say we want to value marriage and singleness as equally good gifts. Now, to be sure, marriage is good. I'm preaching at a wedding on Saturday, and I won't be saying, well, you know, this is an okay occasion. It would have been fine if they hadn't got together, but hey, we're here. <laughs> marriage is good, but also we want to celebrate singleness as well and not give the impression that that's a sort of second-hand sort of state. I actually used the phrase recently and wanted to repent of it immediately. It talked about somebody being still single, as though hopefully they'll get past that at some point. Marriage and singleness are equally good gifts. And it's good to try and find ways to celebrate the single members within our church life. I mean, let's be honest, there are plenty of opportunities to celebrate marriage, the wedding, wedding anniversaries, and so on. Often if people are part of a nuclear family, you know, they'll celebrate birthdays and so on. It's great if churches can take the initiative in actually celebrating those who are single, maybe at special birthdays, if, you know, assuming they actually want to celebrate it. But, you know, just finding ways to value both singleness and marriage. And linked to that is this. Church family members instinctively share meals, homes, holidays, festivals, money, family life with others from different backgrounds and life situations to them. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, as you look in the Gospels, how Jesus defines family. You know, Jesus is told, hey, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he looks around at his disciples and says, no, no, here are my mother and my brothers. Your know, family are my fellow disciples. But you know that lovely moment where Jesus is at the cross, and there's Mary, and there's the disciple Jesus loves, almost certainly John, and Jesus says, Mother, here's your son. Son, here's your mother. And John takes Mary into her home, his home. And I remember, I always thought, oh, isn't it nice Jesus looks after his mum? And that's true. But I think there's something deeper going on. At the cross, a whole new family is created. So that people who aren't blood relatives are now mother and son, brother and sister. You do know the Christian is part of two families. And it's just useful having that perspective in our minds. It isn't nuclear family and church, it's nuclear family and spiritual family. That means we'll value stuff like friendship and not see friendship as a kind of second-class relationship. The thing probably next to just the Lord holding on to me that has enabled me to persevere have just been deep friendships. People who know me and love me and I know and love them and where there's just an openness there, so I'm known. That's massively precious. Actually, to be honest, we all need that, irrespective of whether we're single or married. But valuing that. It's in John's Gospel where, where Jesus defines friendship in an interesting way. He says, I call you my friends because, well, a servant doesn't know his master's business, but everything given to me by the Father I've made known to you. In other words, you're my friends because I've been open with you. And those relationships of openness, part of being a family together, are going to be important and precious. Then lastly, no one be pressurized into expecting or seeking any healing or change that God has not promised any of us until the renewal of all things. You know, sometimes as I look at those within the church who are now the leading proponents for same-sex marriage, I disagree with them hugely. I have to be honest, I know one or two of the stories in the background and I can see why they've got there. You know, they were the generation who, well, let's try and carry an exorcism out on you to get rid of the demon of homosexuality. And when you end up doing stuff like that, that ends up being fairly pastorally crass, unless, by the way, you're about to exercise temptation out of all of us, there is just a problem there. God can do anything, but it seems to me he hasn't promised that temptation will be moved this side of a new creation. All of us are going to face different battles. Gloriously, Jesus won the ultimate victory. Sin doesn't control us anymore. But we're going to have a battle with temptation and sin until we get to the new creation. And I think it's just helpful to reflect on that. So those are just 10 points. Uh, you can find them up on the, uh, the Living Out website. Just to reflect on how we're we doing as a church. Are we making the church family a good place 
for those who experience same-sex attraction. Now, can I be honest? I am by and large encouraged, actually, as I travel around churches and speak on this subject. What I do pick up is a desire to be a pillar and foundation of truth and hold on to this whilst being a good family. I'm largely encouraged, actually. But the call is just to do that more and more. Just the last thing before we think about living it out in society. One last point, just some observations on pastoral care. So what do you do if a friend within the church comes and says, is this something I can talk to you about? Actually, I, I might be gay. I'm Same-sex attraction, that's an issue for me. And you're kind of thinking, oh, I'm so glad you told me. What do I say now? We always want to be those who listen. Can I say this? If you hear the story of one person experiencing same-sex attraction, you've heard the story of one person experiencing same-sex attraction. Funnily enough, I shouldn't have done this. I've made some hideous mistakes in pastoral care on this issue. Because basically somebody would come and say, you know, I experienced same-sex attraction. And I immediately thought, oh, I know all about that because I know my story. And of course, your story must be exactly the same as mine. It's actually, it's always different. So, again, amongst friends that I know, there are friends that I know who primarily would experience same-sex attraction but are in marriage to somebody of the opposite sex, and they can make that work. And that will be the case, and I suspect it won't be for me, but it probably can be for others. And that's just a question you listen to. Just, can you tell me your story? Tell me what that's like for you? Because, by the way, actually, if people have spoken to you about it, it's because they want to talk. So let them talk. Let them get various things off their chest, as it were. And then three phrases, or three words, if you like, that I think can be helpful to reflect on in this whole area. Firstly, it is temptation. At one level, this is temptation to engage in behavior that isn't pleasing to God. But at another level, it is also suffering. And it's useful to have both of those together, actually. So it probably isn't something somebody would naturally choose. It probably, as a Christian, does mean not having a, a sexual partner, not having kids and so on. Sometimes it can make friendships more confusing than you'd want. And those who've helped me most are those who've got both of those. You know, they want to help me, encourage me to be godly. They've also been good at weeping with those who weep occasionally. But also, if we can put a little that, blessings. Funnily enough, as we face things in life we wouldn't choose, and we trust those to the Lord, the Lord can do wonderfully good things through them. I would have been a nightmare as a pastor, I suspect, without some experience of same-sex attraction. Not because all pastors need to experience same-sex attraction. It's just the rest of my life have been actually really smooth, loving family, healthy. I'd have been a nightmare as a pastor. You've got problems. Gosh, I really can't understand that. <laughs> I'm just really thankful for, actually, the Lord in some ways giving me something I wouldn't have chosen. That's been painful. That, hopefully, on a good day, enables me to be vaguely compassionate to others. And so, actually, as we do pastoral care, can you see any ways God is working you through this? It's not a bad question to ask, actually. But above all else, listening. Just tell me, what's it like for you? How can I help you? How can I love you? Let's move on. Let's think a little bit about how we live this out in society. Because we'll be aware that everything that I've said, probably if I tried to sort of say it in a public meeting with a mixture of Christians and non-Christians, it wouldn't quite be as sort of happy and smiley as it vaguely looks now there will be a, a significant level of disagreements. I want to talk about one or two principles I think are important, and then we'll try and get a little bit more practical. I think a vital distinction that historically we've not been good at drawing is that our expectations of church and our expectations of society are different and should be different, actually. So I am passionate about the church standing firm on this. 
Because the church's role is to point to Christ and the church forever. I'm passionate, if you like, about the purity of the church on this issue. And so while I have Christian friends who are wobbling on this, I want to do all I can to persuade them to come back to Jesus' teaching on sexuality and marriage. But it's worth reflecting on what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5. Paul, again, has just been arguing for the purity of the church. And he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral. In that case, you would have to leave this world. In other words, Paul is saying, actually, as we think about the non-Christian world out there, we are to go towards those who are sexually immoral in the world. We're to go towards the gay couple living down the street. We're not to distance ourselves from them because they're living in a way that isn't pleasing to Jesus. No, no, we're to go towards them. Does that make sense? There is just a difference. We argue for the purity of the church and we go and do evangelism and mission and compassion towards people in the world around us. And that, it seems to me, is a vital biblical principle. So let me try and apply that in two areas. Let's talk about pride and weddings. You might have noticed, probably quite hard to miss the fact that we've just been through Pride Month. And you know, I, I, was, I don't live in London, but happened to be in London one day and was, I think, standing at Tottenham Court Road and looking down one of the main streets and just seeing Pride flag upon Pride flag upon Pride flag. And it, 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 in a sense, it just took me aback, just the sheer sort of, whoa, in your face. Now, imagine there was a sort of non-Christian person stood next to me and said, well, you slightly surprised by that. What do you make of it all? I wonder what you'd say. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you turn to somebody next to you and say, this is what you'd say. I want to hold two perspectives. Here's the first. I want to treat everybody as worthy of dignity and respect and made in the image of God. And the reason it is important to say that is just because of history. You know, part of me can see how you end up with pride if you've got a group who historically have been criminalized, historically been on the receiving end of bullying. Historically, for those older who've lived through the AIDS epidemic of the 1980s and seen many of their friends die, that's got to affect, in some sense, how I'm going to view this. I want to treat everybody as worthy of dignity and respect. In a sense, I want Christians to be at the forefront of any campaign against homophobic bullying, actually. And then I'm also saying, oh, gosh, this is so sad. Because pride, is, pride takes us away from the God who made us. I mean, pride is quite a hard concept to celebrate at the best of times. But also what it's celebrating is a lifestyle that is different to the one God has designed, that doesn't reflect where the universe is going, and cuts people off from the God who made them. And, and you see what I'm trying to do? That I'm trying to say two things, and I know it's much easier to remember one. But probably in all my answers, I'm wanting to say both of those. What do I make of it? Look, I understand this is a group who's been historically on the receiving end of bullying, and I want them to be treated with respect. But if I'm honest, I struggle to celebrate it because I think it's taking people away from the life that God gives and the best identity available. I just think we need to be good at saying both of those things, actually. Because I think that's a Christian worldview, and I think that's trying to communicate with the world around us. You know, sometimes, again, people are often, actually not just public sector, private sector as well. Can you put the rainbow lanyard on? And I guess the difficulty at that point is I'm trying to think, what, what am I saying here? Am I standing against homophobic bullying? Am I celebrating a lifestyle that is displeasing to God? And it's difficult because that's all tied together. Sorry, if you want a nice, easy answer, sorry. But in a sense, what I would want to say is, can we chat about this? And, and those are the two points I'm wanting to make. Let me talk about weddings. What do you do 
when your friends, maybe distant family member, invites you to their gay wedding? Again, forgive me, I'm not going to give you an easy answer, but here's where I'm landing on this, and you don't have to follow me, you genuinely don't. Personally, I would really struggle to be at, if I can put all this, in an inverted commas Christian gay wedding, where we're inviting God to bless something that we know he doesn't. I'm not sure I could be there, actually, because I think that would be saying something false about God. Funnily enough, I would actually find it slightly easier to be at a completely secular gay wedding, actually, where God's not mentioned, God's not involved. Funnily enough, I've never actually been invited. I've got gay friends, but they've never actually got married yet, so I've never been in this position. And I think this is a conscience issue, so please, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but... I think the two options then become to say to the friends, look, you probably know I'm a Christian, I believe marriage is about something different, so you know, this might be a struggle for me, but I, I want to show my love for you, so I will be there. Or flip side, and I think this is totally a conscience issue, actually, you know what I believe as a Christian, so sadly I can't be there, but I'd love to have you and your partner around for a meal afterwards. Take your pick. I think that's genuinely a conscience issue as to where you want to land on that. But hopefully you're trying to get, I'm giving you a sense of, what are we trying to do here? Standing up for human dignity, but also grieving, if you like, over a lifestyle that takes people away from God. But let's think through our overall attitude Here's a verse. I think 1 Peter, by the way, 1 Peter, it seems to me, is just a vital letter for our times. So 1 Peter is a letter written to Christians who probably aren't being sort of led off to martyrdom at this point, but they're certainly regarded as a bit odd. 1 Peter 4, they think you are strange. And I think 1 Peter 2 verse 12 is a massively important uh, verse for us. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, no matter how gracious, how compassionate, how kind we are on this, I suspect, if I'm honest, there is no way around Christians being accused of doing wrong on it. That is going to happen. Christians are going to be regarded as bigoted and prejudiced, no matter how nice we are. And I wish I could say that's not the case. The, the thing I'd simply say is this. You do realize that's normal? Christians being accused of doing wrong, that is kind of normal run of things for the Christian. But what's our response to that? As Christians are accused of doing wrong, we get really angry and defensive, and I don't know, we launch petitions and so on. Peter says, as you're accused of doing wrong by the world around you, go back into that world and do good. Be known for your kindness. Be known for your compassion. The gay couple down the street, one of them needs a lift to the hospital. Be the one who does it. Show that level of kindness. Live good lives. I think that quality of Christians contributing to their community, living good lives, is in particularly important in a context where Christians will be accused of doing wrong. Here's a great mission statement for a church. Our goal is to baffle people. <laughs> Our goal is to baffle people. I just find your view on sexuality, it's just so old-fashioned and so prejudiced and so bigoted and, and yet you're kind and compassionate and loving. How does that work? Or to put it differently, our goal is to leave a great big question mark behind us. What's, what's going on with you guys? And then as you leave this question mark behind you, how do we answer the question? A while back, I was up in Edinburgh, it was uh, Scripture Union in Scotland had uh, put an event together for various school Christian unions to, to come together. Uh, and by the way, you do know teenagers are the group that have this hardest. 
the, the school, Christians in school, they're the ones who have this hardest. You might find it hard at work. Believe me, it would be harder for the teenagers at school. And we were just sort of talking about this, and, and they said to me, look, Andy, the question we keep getting asked at school is this. Why do you hate gay people? Yeah, that was what these 17-year-olds kept getting asked at school. And so we kind of role-played the answer a little bit. Why do you hate gay people? And we kind of role-played it and say, we don't, full stop. Because often we'd say, well, we don't, but dot, 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 dot. And actually, there is value to say, no, we don't. We believe people, irrespective of their sexuality, are precious, loved by God, valued by God. We don't, full stop. Yeah, but you don't think they should have sex, do you? Well, that's because of what we think the universe is about. Full stop. So what do you think the universe is about then? Quite like that question. <laughs> Can I tell you about the love story at the heart of the universe? Of the God who made us loving us despite the fact that we ignore him. Loving us loving enough enough loving us enough to come to earth to die for us. And the force of that love is so strong that the best equivalent we've got is sex and marriage. And sex and marriage is ultimately about pointing to that. Now, it might be that my non-Christian friend is slightly baffled at this point, but at least we're talking about Jesus, which is kind of what I want to talk about. Does that help? Just to try and put those things together... We believe in human dignity. We have a love story at the heart of the universe that determines everything else. And that's what we want to talk about, ultimately. You do know the person who's best at this. The person who's best at this is, of course, Jesus. As you look at the Gospels, I don't think there's any way around the fact that Jesus has got a fairly tight sexual ethic. I mean, we talked about Jesus defining marriage as male and female, and that's before you get to gouging your eye out in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus got a pretty tight sexual ethic. And yet sexual sinners run towards him. Have you noticed that? Presumably they sense the love, the compassion within him. And of course there's one particular sexual sinner, married five times now with a man who's not a husband. And to that woman, Jesus will say this, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I don't know whether you've noticed the sort of sexual revolution as it were over the last 60 years or so. We're not noticeably happier as a culture. And here you have a woman, if you like, you can put it like this, slightly broken by her own sexual revolution. And into that context, Jesus offers glorious living water. The relationship for which we are designed. The eternal marriage relationship with God. I want us to have confidence that even in our culture, the gospel really is still good news because we offer people living water that satisfies now and forever. So please don't retreat in fear. We've still got the glorious good news of Jesus. You do know that the first century wasn't particularly noted for its clarity on sexual ethics, just as the 21st century isn't. And yet into that world, the gospel spread. And the gospel is still powerful today. I've given you a lot to think about. Um, we're gonna, we've got about 13, 12 minutes or so for, for questions. So... Um, Martin is poised, so do, do feel free to lob any questions which I may or may not be able to answer. Great. Opposite side of the room, it's always brilliant, isn't it? Great. Um, in Wigan for Pride, we get a group of people who come with placards and cause absolute havoc with our mission um, in Wigan. Uh, we find that people are put off from going to chur into churches, they feel that they're not um, accepted within churches. And, um, you know, it's just a real problem that people come in with their placards and then just leave us with a problem, which, which they don't have. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think where you have those who, I don't know, are, are using biblical verse and so on, placards and, and so on, that yeah, there will be truth in what they are saying, and as much as there will, I, I imagine they're warning that actually a lifestyle apart from God leads to ultimate and eternal disaster, which is true. I think, though, in that context, if I were in a, a church context there, I would probably be also emphasizing the first of those two elements that I said, actually, which is to say, look, we do believe a pathway of pride generally, and sexual sin is a pathway to eternal disaster, but we also believe in speaking about individuals with dignity and respect. And so that's kind of why I'm trying to say those are the two things. We, we do need to say both, but I, in that context, I would probably be wanting to major on the first of those. Just wanting to clarify, you said that we need to have a distinction between the church and society. Just wondering, how do you not fall into the trap of the myth of neutrality? Because when I think about this, Jesus made it pretty clear that he has all authority in heaven yeah. and on earth. Yeah. And I think a lot of times Christians will treat society like Jesus isn't still Lord of it. Yeah. So I'm wondering what that would look like more practically. I, thank you. That's a really useful question and actually a, a healthy corrective. Um, the, I do think the way the New Testament works is obviously the New Testament authors do have the clarity that Jesus is Lord over all. But for instance, in 1 Corinthians 5, I think there is a difference between how you treat a, a professing Christian who's sitting to a non-Christian who's sitting, actually. So I, I think there is the clarity within the New Testament, Jesus is Lord of all, but you do treat them slightly differently. I, I think there is an issue in Romans 1, say, and I probably alluded to this yesterday about causes and symptoms. So the cause of the problem in society is we don't thank God or glorify God. The, the, the sort of symptom of that is various things, including sort of approval, say, of same-sex marriage, is a symptom of our rejection of God. Now, occasionally you can treat symptoms, and so part of me would want to argue for Christian freedom and freedom of speech and so on. But by and large, I think you end up in a problem if you just treat the, spend most of your time on the symptoms without dealing with the cause. And that's why, for me, evangelism and proclaiming the gospel will always be the priority is because that's the cause of the problem. People need to get to know Jesus. If you just deal with symptoms, you're not really going to deal with the underlying cause. And so that's why on this issue, my, my main concern isn't probably going to be to try and reverse the position on same-sex marriage, partly because I don't think that will happen. My main concern is I want to talk about Jesus because that deals with the root of the problem rather than a symptom. I don't know how easy this one will be, but imagine you've got two people who are deeply committed to each other and love each other, a bit like David and Jonathan, and that must come up quite a lot. Um, but they decide to buy a house together, they live together, but there is no sex in their okay. commitment. Um, but they are same-sex attracted, but yeah. there's just no sex. They just love one another and make decisions together and everything, but there's just no sex. Yeah, good question. Again, I, I want to be slightly nuanced on this in terms of um, what, I, what I'm very positive about are deep friendships. You know, I, I think, and I, actually for those who are same-sex attracted, I, I don't think we should be anxious about deep friendships with people of the same sex. Bizarrely, for me, I think temptation is lessened when I have deep friendships rather than when I actually have them, as it happens. Um, and so I am in favor of deep friendships. I am slightly cautious about a category confusion, if that makes sense. So I'm, friendships, it seems to me, are not, are not exclusive. Actually, they are with sort of several people. And so I, I'm not saying people in that position are, are sinning. What I would be wanting to encourage them away from, though, is seeing that relationship as almost kind of marriage-like, because I, I think friendship is, a, is something with several people rather than just looking into each other's eyes. So I, I, I can see the point, and I'm not saying that is definitely wrong, but I would, I think, want to counsel people towards several deep friendships rather than, well, this one individual can sort out all my needs. Does that make sense? I, again... 
that's one where probably if you've got different people in the same position as me, we'd probably take slightly different lines. Thank you, and uh, thanks for your, your, um, your teaching on this. It's been very helpful. Um, do you think there is a, a confusion in society over the word love? Because in love, yeah. in this country, you know, in our language, we have one word, but in the Greek, they had many words. And can, is that leading potentially to people going down the same-sex attraction route, which they may not have otherwise done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is, if I'm honest, there is basically an idolatry of sexual and romantic love, to be honest. I, I think that's what's going on. Love is love is basically, if I'm honest, saying love is God, love is supreme, love is king. Uh, and it's an extension of the look inside yourself, see what's there and live it out. So look inside, so who, who do I feel sexual and romantic attraction to? That is the most important thing about me, and I, I live that out. Um, and in a sense, let's say, the challenge is the, the Christian equivalent of that can be an idolatry of marriage, actually making something that is good ultimate. Uh, and so part of me does want to push back. To, part of me wants, <laughs> to be honest, whenever people say love is love, part of me, so can you actually clarify what you mean by that? Um, and I think us talking about, you're right, love, I mean, in the New Testament, love picks up a whole range of different things. And probably it's helpful for us to reflect that slightly more. Andy, I found it really helpful when you were talking about awareness of history. When someone's carrying scars because the church has hurt them yeah. deeply, would you change the way that you speak? And then, and then they extrapolate that onto how Jesus is. So they see how yeah. the church is behaving, and then they think, well, that's what Jesus is like, which is I, it's just so sad. Would you change your pastoral conversation or your emphases when you're speaking to somebody like that? Yeah, thank you. So what if somebody's had a really bad experience of, of church? I, I just think that's where, where listening is massively important, actually. So in any conversation around sexuality, I'm going to spend the bulk of my time before I say anything. Look, can you tell me your story? Tell me what it's like for you. Have you had any experience of church? You know, and I'm just wanting to spend a lot of time listening, and then I'm going to respond. So if, I mean, it's always difficult in this in, in terms of sometimes people can talk about having had a bad experience of church. And actually all that has happened, to be honest, is that biblical sexual ethics have been taught. And so I, I do want to be slightly cautious on that. So I know there are various campaigning groups who would describe me as not safe to talk to. You know, I, I know various people have labeled me as an unsafe person for gay people to talk to. I think that's mildly harsh. Um, and so part of me does want to do a little bit of, OK, what's gone on? Is it that they've not been treated with dignity and respect? Or is it actually they're just slightly pushing back against biblical sexual ethics? And I can only find that out as I'm listening and asking questions. If it is that they've basically been on the receiving end of homophobia, not treated with dignity and respect, then I'm saying, look, I'm so sorry. That shouldn't have happened. As Christians, we do believe everybody is valuable. And actually look at the way Jesus comes to people who are broken in a whole variety of ways sexually, and I will be emphasizing that more in that sort of context. Andy, do you see any issues with the government's plans to ban homosexual um, conversion therapy? Yeah, I, I do, sadly. Um, I mean, I, I think the key issue around conversion therapy is precisely how it is defined. Um, I mean, again, there is some really bad history in this, sort of really coercive attempts to change people's basic sexual attractions and so on. But I think as I hear definitions of conversion therapy, it, it could well include sort of praying that somebody would have the strength to, say, to stay celibate would be included within the category of conversion therapy. And that, I think, could well cause problems and difficulties for us. So I think it's certainly something we should be praying about, it's trying to push actually when there's discussions. So can you please define conversion therapy uh, for me? I mean, let's be honest, Christians get persecuted. So let's not be surprised that stuff like this happens, but I think it is a good issue to be praying about.